see myself in the pouring home See the light come over, no I see myself in the pouring rain I watch hope come over me Hi, I'm Moby, and welcome to the inaugural first episode of Moby Pod. Of course, the name is a pun ish. Is that a pun, Lindsay? Moby Pod? Or because if people don't know, sorry, I, I, I'm talking over you and you haven't even said anything. <laughs> Moby Pod? A double, a double entendre? It is perhaps more of a double entendre than a pun because if you don't know, a pod. A group of whales is a pod, and I'm named after a whale. So we thought Moby, or rather, okay, I'm not even going to throw you under the bus, Lindsay. I thought Moby Pod would be a good name. So if it's a terrible name, you're not responsible. Here's what I like to think of is a pod of ocean mammals with your head just (laughs) jumping around, eating seaweed. I don't know if... Whales eat seaweed, but do they? Now You're, I'm, I'm Moby, so Moby mammal, Moby ocean mammal, mammals would. But I just had this vision of like, when you say a pod of whales with my head on the whales, I just think of these like anxious, awkward, middle-aged whales, kind of like not even jumping around, just sort of like swimming and being uncomfortable. Yeah, same. Sounds yeah. nice. <laughs> Sounds really so, fun. So yeah, so this is our, the first episode. Yeah, of, do you want to, do you want to like... Introduce yourself and tell people who don't know. I mean, everyone who's listening to this probably knows who you are. But do you want to say why you're making a podcast? Partially. Well, hi, my name's Moby, and I am making a podcast because I love the idea of hanging out and talking to you, mm-hmm. hanging out and talking to Bagel, who's currently napping next to you on the couch. She's loving this. And having the ability to talk about anything, which might be self-evident, but it just, I love the idea of like our, the, the podcast, Moby Pod, it's potentially about everything. It's about animals, it's about politics, it's about music, it's about health, it's about ridiculous nonsense because I'm a ridiculous human being. Um, just at, ridiculousness, direct to consumer. There's a lot of ridiculousness, but there's a lot of earnestness. Earnestness? Is that a word? Earnest-y, Probably. Earnestity? So <laughs> this is... My overly long-winded intro to Moby Pod and my my co-host Lindsay, and because I'm a loudmouth, I feel bad because I'm talking too much. So Lindsay, why don't you tell us, including me, because I don't know at this point what we're going to talk about today, like what what well, what themes and subjects we might be looking at? Great. Well, first of all, hi, I'm Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. A lot of you that know who Moby is probably don't know who I am. Um, I'm the mother of a tiny dog named Bagel, but also Moby and I are collaborators on some stuff sometimes, not in the music world, but in the making weird things world. Um, Like we have a short film doing the festival circuit right now called Why I'm a Vegan that I think is cute as heck. Um, And other things of that nature. Um, And we thought a podcast would be a really fun thing to do together. And so today, what are we going to talk about? Today, we're going to talk about um, some music stuff. I have some questions about some of this music you speak of. Okay. Um, We're going to talk about a little bit of politics, a little bit of things I think are funny, that I think it'll be funny to hear you talk about them. And we're going to talk about David Bowie. I really want to know some stuff about David Bowie, and I know you know a lot, and your relationship with him was really cool. And we're going to hear more about that. Okay. And then hopefully as soon as we're done recording this podcast, we'll make another one. And at some point, um, even though we are both loudmouths, although I, I I might be more of a loudmouth, uh, I'm not sure. It's not a competition. Um, Loquacious feels correct. I spend a lot of time alone, and so on the rare (laughs) occasion when I'm actually with human beings, I got a lot to say. (laughs) So, yeah, so for future podcasts, we'll probably even have guests on, Um, but I'm a little wary of having guests on because I'm afraid that if we have guests, I'm just going to talk over them, and I don't want to be the host who, like, invites someone on the podcast and then just rambles on while they try to talk. I don't think you give yourself enough credit because I've seen you in conversation with people and you're very good at asking 
questions and listening and synthesizing and, you know, following up in a, in a thoughtful way. Oh, well, thanks. That's kind of you to say. So and I think it could go really well. Great. So without any further ado, um, let's start the inaugural episode of Moby Pod. Podcast commence. Hey, Moby. He is. Do you, <laughs> do you know that song that's like, that's like, here we are now going to Southside. Sure. Oh, wait. You, you mean the song that we played at the beginning of the podcast? Yeah, with the music video where Gwen Stefani licked your head. Yeah. And you had a, you had a kind of um, like funny glasses on, mm-hmm. like sunglasses. Yeah, I'm... I'm I, I, for so many reasons, I'm familiar with the song. <laughs> At the risk of really sounding like a self-involved dick, one of the main reasons I'm familiar with it is that I wrote it and recorded it. Wow. And released it under my name. Humble brag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, why did you write that? Boy, oh boy. We, oh, again, this is one of the dangers of being old is I feel like I could self-involvedly talk about the story of this particular song for a year because well, there's so much weirdness to it. Okay. Um, so the song itself, I remember so clearly when I wrote it. It would have been the summer of 1998. A beautiful summer. And I was making music for what I thought was going to be my last album, Play. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting upstairs at my little loft, and I thought, like, my career was done. You know, this was a dark time in my little life. Like, I was battling panic attacks. Uh, I was actually part of a panic attack study at Columbia University. Whoa. And my mom had died. I was kind of on the verge of being broke. Although How old were you at this time? 32. So quite young. And I was sitting upstairs in my loft, and I was playing... Okay, musically, the idea was to juxtapose a sort of slightly menacing verse with an incredibly happy chorus. So the verse is just B to D flat minor. Because the verse is like, I'm a mad person in a bad place. (laughs) (laughs) And then as I was playing that on acoustic guitar, I then thought, oh, what if I play the happiest chord progression Ever, which was E major to A flat minor to A major. Yeah. Like very happy. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. So I recorded yeah, that's really it. Fun. And I mixed it at Unique Studios. In just the music. You didn't have the words yet. No. You didn't have words. You just recorded the music. So I recorded the music and I wrote the words. And then I finished it by mixing it. I mean, this is, again, I could, like, every weird little last aspect of it to me is interesting. Like, it was one of (laughs) the last times I was ever at a studio in Times Square. Because Times Square used to be where all the studios were, pre-gentrification. And And now it's just 70s Sephoras. Yeah. And these studios, not to dismiss your 70s Sephoras, because you're absolutely right. It's just... That's all it is now. Yeah. So unique studios where this was mixed. One of the things that made Times Square Studios so fascinating in the 80s and the 90s was, the first of all, they were filthy. They were all like just old black leather couches. They were dirty. And like sometimes you'd go to these studios and Run DMC would be there. Sometimes Crazy. Aerosmith and or the Rolling <laughs> Stones would be there. Sometimes Limp Biscuit would be there. Like you just, you never knew who was going to be at these studios. And it was such an interesting thing leaving these studios in Times Square because you'd leave at one in the morning in Times Square when Times Square was really scummy. And it was just this quintessential New York moment. Like Mm -hmm. you'd mix a song and you'd leave at one in the morning seeing like Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones like smoking cigarettes in the lobby and you'd walk out in Times Square and it'd be cold and it just felt so wonderfully New York. Yeah. Yeah. So, not make the long story too much longer. The song is also a little bit of a... First of all, it's the only top 40 song I've ever had in the United States. I think it got to number three in the charts here. What year was that? Mm, 2000. So, that's the only thing I have in common with Jimi Hendrix, is he and I have both... We are both (laughs) only ever had one song in the top 40. Um, Crazy. Um, Yeah, that's wild to think about. And then lyrically, the song is supposed to be 
about sort of similar to your favorite video uh, video game, Stray. <laughs> um, it's about a post-apocalyptic future where life has kind of lost a lot of meaning. And why did you want to write a song about that? Because I thought it was interesting, especially to make like a super happy chorus with the understanding that's what the song's about. And then time passed, the album came out and it became very weirdly successful considering it was supposed to be my well, last. Well, but you had Gwen Stefani on the track, which was like... Not on the album version. She Her version came later. Oh, so you put this song out with just you on play. Yeah. And then later, well, how did the... Okay, wait. I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to ask that question later. Or I'll let you tell Okay, it. so she recorded... She actually recorded vocals for the song Southside earlier, like, you know, at the beginning. Mm-hmm. But then I ended up not using her version on the album because <gasps> the, the mix that I had without her, I thought, sounded better for the album. Then... The people at the record label heard the version with her and they loved it. And they're like, wow, this needs to be a single. And so then we remastered the album with her vocals. To be clear, her vocals are great. I just thought that the original had a little more of like a lo-fi, grungy quality to it. Wow. That is a sick burn to Stefani. No, I mean, no, her her contribution was great. No, so, she's she sounds so good. And y'all, the music video is so good. Okay, so... Moving forward, so keep in mind, this was supposed to be my last album. It was supposed to fail, and then all of a sudden it became really successful. Like, mm-hmm. at one point, Play was selling, I think, 150,000 copies a week. Crazy. Which, that that doesn't even happen anymore. Even Like, I don't even think Taylor Swift and Adele, that happens with them. But, like, back then, people bought CDs. Yeah. So, it came time to make the video, and this is the embarrassing part. <laughs> The budget for the video was, I think, around $750,000. Wow. It was ridiculous. To make the video shoot, they flew me in via helicopter. Like Where I did bas- you shoot it? Because I was on tour. Oh. And so basically I would like fly into Los Angeles on a helicopter, do the video shoot all day, and then get back on the helicopter and fly to whatever show I was doing. Clearly not the most climate-friendly way of making a video. Mm-mm. That was in the 90s when we just, like, put gasoline in the pool because we were like, "Mm, yum, pollution. (laughs) Like, climate change was just, like, this weird idea that, like, we were like, oh, Al Gore apparently wrote a book about it, but no one really knew anything more than that. Yeah. (laughs) So, but just the excess. And then the video came out and became this huge MTV hit and radio hit. But the other minor interesting thing, it was only a hit in the United States. (laughs) So when I played it, in concerts outside the United States, that's when people would go to get a snack. They're like, play porcelain, dumbass. Yeah, like like <laughs> Southside, here, the biggest song I've ever had. Outside the United States, no one knows it. Crazy. And then, coming a full circle, next year, I'm actually putting out this album called Resound. It's a follow-up to the album Reprise, which is like doing sort of orchestral versions of some of my songs. So mm-hmm. the version of Southside I did with uh, Ricky Wilson from the Kaiser Chiefs. Wow, Kaiser Chiefs. Yeah. Because I love the Kaiser Chiefs and I love his voice. So, yeah, so there's this very, like, it's tons of horns. Like, it's, I can't play it because it doesn't, doesn't, hasn't come out yet. But it's, um, it's a really, I think it's a really sort of, like, interesting, very aggressive version of Southside. So there's probably a million more things I could say about the song, but I've already rambled on way too much. Wait, but I still have some questions. Oh, okay. Which is, like... I understand that, like, the apocalypse is really interesting to you, but, like, when you were writing it, did you have, like, scenes in your head of some, like, world that doesn't exist? Like, how do you come, how does that happen? Like, what is the visualization? What is that path? Oftentimes when you, when people think of an apocalypse, similar to your the video game Stray that you like, it's <laughs> like everything's gone wrong. And I yeah. was like, what about the the middle ground like an apocalypse that kind of looks like one of those cities like Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea where it's just stuff doesn't work mm-hmm. you know like you can't really drink the water you, the air is kind of foul and the mo- every time you leave your house it's unsafe and so that's kind of like the idea that there's this interim apocalypse that we'll probably get to at some point where even the United States is like that. I mean, the United States, we've always had urban areas, 
that have been like that, but it seems mm-hmm. like it's sort of potentially heading more in that direction. So it's kind of about like an apocalypse that would be normal to the kids who lived in it. Cool. Like if you're born in that, it just is what you know. So it's writing a song from that perspective. That's amazing. You know, because I'd still like go out and do kid things, but it would be during what we would consider an apocalypse. Kind of like I remember reading or hearing testimonials from like people who lived in Sarajevo during the war. And like it was war, people were dying left and right, but they still did, they still went to parties. You know, they still did normal things in the middle of all this apocalyptic chaos. It makes me think of, you know, the song Ring Around the Rosy? Pocket full of posy. Oh, it's about plague victims. Yeah, yeah like mm-hmm. ring around the rosy is like the the red rings you would get around like the sores and pocket. You carried posies in your pockets because you smelled of rotting human, which you were. Yep. And then ashes, ashes was actually apparently supposed to be at you, at you, because before you died, you sneezed. You had an uncontrollable sneezing fit. We all fall down. Yep. And then you're dead. So it's kind of like that. Like yeah, like in the middle of the plague. People still wrote children's songs. Yeah. So that's that's what was going through my head when I was writing the lyrics. Oh, one last <laughs> interesting thing is in 2002, I did this festival tour with David Bowie. Um, it was David Bowie, Buster Rhymes, and myself, The year and the Blue Man Group. And the year before, I'd done it with Outkast and The Roots. Mm-hmm. So David Bowie and Buster Rhymes and Blue Man Group and I, we played at Jones Beach. Mm-hmm. This big venue in Long Island. Mm-hmm. And there was a huge thunderstorm. And one of the opening lines of Southside is, here we are in the pouring rain. And I pulled, okay, this is going to sound, again, self-aggrandizing, but it was actually a really special moment. Because normally when it rains, either the show gets canceled or the performer hides under a safe place. But I pulled, I was like, if, there, if the audience is going to be in the rain, I'm going to be in the rain. So I pulled my microphone out to the front of the audience. So I was getting drenched just the way they were. And when I sang Here We Are in the Pouring Rain, 25,000 people screamed at the top of their lungs. It was a very special concert wow. moment. Wow. Weren't you afraid you would get electrocuted? It was wireless mics. So like when you have a wireless guitar, wireless mic, it's like, yeah, like sure, stuff could go wrong. But it's not the old days when things when you're like connected via a cable to the power grid. Okay. Good. It probably wasn't smart. I was really worried about you. (laughs) But no, I didn't get electrocuted. Everything worked fine. And I just got drenched. That sounds really... I wish there was video of that. If it happened now, you know it'd be all over TikTok. (laughs) (laughs) So that's the profoundly long-winded, that could be even more long-winded story of that song, Southside. Here we are now. (laughs) That's... Yeah. (laughs) It's a real catchy tune you made. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. The first thing I have is a little segment I like to call, Moby, why are you like this? Mm -hmm. Where I ask why you're like this in regard to little things that you do. I'm not a, yeah, I'm not a normal person. So something that I've noticed about you that I wouldn't say I have any sort of feeling about it other than like some amusement, but occasionally concern does creep in. And that is you're, you're an avid tea drinker. Oh, I, by the way, I was just thinking to myself, I was like, wow, I think you just could, uh, I think you almost just described every single facet of my life. (laughs) Like concern. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm an avid. Like amusement with some concern mixed in there. Yeah. So I'm an, I'm, I'm, yeah, I used to own a little tea company. I am an avid tea drinker. Like how many cups of tea would you say you drink in a day? I try to restrict myself. I'd say like four or five. Of like caffeinated teas. Yeah. Like black tea, white tea, green tea, oolong. And do you drink non-caffeinated teas like end of day? Uh, Yes. I enjoy a pleasant herbal infusion. Okay. (laughs) I'm an old person. We like gentle things that are not challenging. Um, I also enjoy an herbal infused tea. But something that you do that I don't think I've seen before mm. is that you your tea cups are white on the outside. They're white cups and so dirty on the inside that they are a deep well, kind of yellow brown... Like a, okay, hold on like a just a second. Lung. Hold on. 
<laughs> because I would just like to say earlier today, I gave you a teacup with water in it. <gasps> I would like you to look at this teacup and it's tell so me far if. Away. Did you put me, it far away for the. Tell me, does it support the premise of your question? <laughs> Is that a dirty okay. teacup? Okay. Or is that a is that one of the cleanest teacups you've ever seen? I wouldn't go that far, honestly. Really? But it is cleaner the, than the teacups of so, of yester your. Okay. So here's here's my here's the story. We're covering all the important stuff here. It's like <laughs> artificial scents, weather, weather teacups. teacups. <laughs> <laughs> We I should just this call this be, like knitting time with Moby. This is going to be a big podcast in the retirement communities. Um, <laughs> Moby and his soft jammies. <laughs> so, okay. So the year is 1987. And <laughs> I had a French girlfriend. And at the time I was living in this abandoned factory in the crack neighborhood. And I was broke. But I saved enough money to go with her to Paris because we had a place to free, free place to stay. A friend of hers had this empty apartment in Paris. So I... First time leaving the United States, went to Paris, and I was so nervous and so excited. Like, I couldn't believe I was in Paris, France. <laughs> and I tried dressing like a Parisian. Like, I even had a striped sweater that I bought in a secondhand store. Did you have a little beret or something? I did not have a beret, um, but I had hair at the time. And one of our favorite things to do was to go to this little tea place called Le Bouillonté. I think that's how you pronounce it, La Boulante, Bouillante. And we would sit there and drink tea and play cards. And it was opposite some park somewhere in Paris. And um, they would play Eric Satie. I mean, it was like so perfect and Parisian and idyllic. Um, it actually is what led me to open a tea shop years and years later because I just, this was my favorite thing about going to Paris was going to this little tea shop. But one of the things that impressed me so much was the guy who ran the tea shop was this old French intellectual who didn't really talk, but he like, of course, smoked cigarettes, um, which I thought was so cool. Even though I didn't smoke, it was so cool and French. Like he'd, so he'd bring you your tea and it was like, but all the teacups and all the bowls, everything was completely mismatched. Like it was oh. the most, the tables, the chairs, everything was mismatched. Like the, 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 the boards and the floor were mismatched. Like it was just such a ramshackle place. And I loved that. And the teacups were chipped and the teacups were stained brown because tea has tannins, which stain things brown, teeth, cups. And so I thought, wow, this is so cool that this guy doesn't, like he's so bohemian. He doesn't care about his teacups. And so I... When I started drinking a lot of tea, I was like, wow, I'm inspired by this old French intellectual bohemian and I'm not, I'm going to wash my teacups, but I'm not going to try and clean the tannins out of them. <gasps> and then our friend Lindsay Lewis was over at my house and I served her something in a cup and I realized like, oh, for most people, a cup that is stained deep, deep brown looks filthy. Like it looked like she was horrified, like almost like, how dare you give me a liquid in this filthy brown? And I was immediately like defensive, like, no, but it's clean. Like I wash them. I just don't <laughs> scrape the brown tannin stuff out. Um, and I I've almost started telling her this story about how I was inspired by going to this tea salon in Paris, France. And I realized then, but not now foolishly, that it sounds so pretentious and ridiculous. <laughs> um, then... Our other friend, this is, I'm taking a tedious story and making it longer and more boring. Our friend Julie Mintz told me about these things called magic sponges. Mm -hmm. And I went out and bought magic sponges. And I realized one thing that magic sponges are really good at is cleaning that brown tannin-y stuff off of teacups. And so now my teacups are borderline pristine. And we checked and there's no, there's no, because I always I think of these magic sponges as like they have to be do like it's devil magic sponges. It might be devil magic, but I think it's just the material that they're made out of. Like we, you and I joined a writer's class and it mainly involved listening. And I'm not so good at that. So what <laughs> I would do on these Zoom calls is turn off my camera, put it on mute, 
and spend two hours going around my house cleaning everything with a magic sponge because I was I was just introduced to this more wonderful world of and I'm not sponsored by magic sponges just to be clear I don't know if they're toxic or not but boy are they good for cleaning up teacups so you don't have to be embarrassed of your teacups when your friends come over like now <laughs> I mean this looks pretty good yeah I gotta say if I didn't know your secret You'd think that I might wouldn't even be, think twice about it. That, that was not a 25-year-old teacup. You would think, huh, what a reasonably new teacup he has. I would. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for that. My pleasure. That was really a uh, uh, global, a international journey. answer. Yep. You're like, how? To in, a very simple cup question. Which might be an interesting segment we can do, like pick the most banal, ridiculous thing you can think of and create a long story around it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we just did it. And there's plenty I'm, more where that came as an from, old I'm person, sure. Boy, I have, give me anything. Give me a, like, show me a light bulb, a teacup, a weird little duck sculpture, and I guarantee you, I can tell you a long, stupid story. Or a teensy tiny baby easel. Yeah, well, that's for bagel. That's yeah, the that's story a short there. story. Something I wanted to challenge us with because I think you're a surprisingly good storyteller Mm -hmm. is to just improvise an adventure movie plot because I feel like your best ideas tend to just come right fresh off the noodle. And so I thought that we could maybe come up with something really compelling right now. We're going to noodle some ideas for adventure movies. Go. So there's a woman who just realized that she can't dance and she thought her whole life she was a great dancer and she meets a guy who loves to dance and she can't and then he breaks up with her and then she gets drunk and falls in a trash can and this is an adventure movie yeah that's the part before the adventure That's an inciting incident. Okay, because it does seem a little bit more like a Sandra Bullock rom-com setup. Yeah, but the breakup is going to lead her to maybe she's going to go to Spain and learn how to salsa with a man named Darnardo. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So for the purpose of this narrative, we encounter the heroine and she's drunk in a garbage can. Yeah, Yeah, that's what happens to her. And then she's like, I got to get out of here. She's, maybe this is too obvious and trite, but so she's in the dumpster and like the guy comes over and some of the people from the bar come over and they're, first they're laughing, but then they look in and they're like, are you okay? And she's like, just leave me alone. And she stays in the dumpster too long. Like she's actually like, And maybe there's some sort of internal monologue. Maybe there's some voiceover. She's talking to herself. She's like, you know, I could get out of the dumpster, but, but why? Like, could she be like a little bit like disgusting Cinderella inside of there where like maybe some animated or like animatronic rats come up and she like can talk to them about what's going on for her. And she's like, yeah, I got, I got no reason to leave. So she stays in the dumpster and eventually she falls asleep in the dumpster because she's very drunk. She was too embarrassed to come out of the dumpster. Yeah. She was trying to wait for everyone to go away. Yeah, I'm just, she's like, I'm just waiting. I need a blank slate. I need to leave. So while she's lying there, a crime happens nearby. Mm-hmm. And someone runs by the dumpster and throws a briefcase or a bag into the dumpster. And the bag contains something. Money and classified government documents from Mar-a-Lago. Or let's say the bag contains... Let's say, the, oh, the bag is empty, but it's a really nice bag. No, it has to have something in it. Maybe vials of Hold on, poison. Hold on. We're going to, we're going to. So the bag is empty, but it's a really nice, like, Chanel coach type bag. And so she's like, that's weird. But, like, we see the backstory of, like, some guy is, like, clutching this bag. He's being chased by serious bad guys. He throws the bag in the dumpster. He keeps running. He keeps running. He gets hit by a bus or gets shot or some, somehow he dies. And she just thinks, like, huh. Maybe my night's not so bad. I've just found this great bag. Yeah. And so she gets out, stumbles home with her new bag, goes goes to bed, wakes up, is smells like dumpster, is like she's like reliving the night. 
And then, but when she relives the light in the night, she's like, oh, well, it wasn't all bad because I got this cool bag. Turns out the bag is the secret, meaning like the material it's made out of or something, it could either be sewn into the lining of the bag or it could just be the material of the bag could be imprinted with something. Okay. I like it. Like codes to a detonator or something like yeah. that. Okay, so the big the big question is, what does the bag contain? Or what is what is what is the bag? And I would love it personally if it's something that we didn't expect. Okay. Because like, it could it could like ease dinosaur DNA. Yes, like or yeah, like some sort of like the encoding of some unknown type of DNA. Or if I was to like raise the stakes, it would be something that ends an industry on earth. Like like a recipe, like maybe it's some sort of code for building cold fusion. Because if there was if there was actual cold fusion energy, mm-hmm. the world's economy, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Russia, Brazil, all these countries that rely on selling oil and petroleum products, they're out of business. So like if you come up with a recipe for actual cold fusion, you will get assassinated within like a second because the most powerful people on the planet will cease to have money in the if there was viable cold fusion. Okay, let's go with cold fusion purse. Or okay, let's say this is some sort of it's an energy secret and it's hidden like the purse is somehow it's 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 encoded within this purse. Um okay, so then she goes out into the world. She's with, using her purse. Using her purse like like she has no idea what it is. The, then the question is how do we reveal what it is? Well, I think that maybe they she she gets spotted with the purse. They start chasing her. They get her. They attack her. But then are then like other secret people come along and they're like, "We'll rescue you," but you have to play by our rules. You're going undercover now. And then it all comes together in the final thing where the guys that are helping her and the guys that are looking for her are all at a soiree in Ibiza, <laughs> where they've where they've escaped to and she has to act like she's the character but the character that they created that she's embodying is an incredible dancer (laughs) okay i'm okay if we in the interest of brevity just sort of leave it at that for now (laughs) and like let's um maybe in future episodes we revisit that yeah this can just be the movie we're constantly creating honestly i mean I, i like that idea the sort of every episode we step Back into the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, step back into the magical story. It, and the story can just be called A Dancer's Bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how can how can anyone resist that? <laughs> <laughs> if I have a question. What's that? Okay. The question is what odd piece of information or knowledge do you have that most people might not know? Not not about you, not about me, not about anything. Just like, just generally speaking, what do you, like a piece of information you know, trivia, science, pop culture, anything, what do you know that other people might not know? Well, it's very, it's very broad. It's hard to narrow it down. Super broad, but like something people might even be surprised by. Like for example... The one I'm going to go with, and I'm sure that someone smart out there or someone with the Google can challenge this, but my understanding is that naked mole rats are essentially immune to cancer and almost every disease that affects other animals. Why? They're trying to figure that out. Can we have that? They're trying to figure that out. I just re- I read an article a while, a while ago, and this is my what my takeaway was that naked mole rats are these super species who somehow don't get cancer. Wow. Again, I should have prepared more, seeing as I'm the one bringing up this question, and not just said something off the cuff from a Scientific American article I probably read ten years ago. But then again, if someone can prove me wrong, by all means prove me wrong, because by proving me wrong, they'll feel pretty good. But I, my understanding is that naked mole rats, who are also one of the most interesting-looking creatures, I learned first learned about them in the movie uh, Errol Morris's Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. 
Um, there are these weird, fascinating, they're naked mole rats. They live <laughs> underground, they're naked, and they're kind of like mole rats. Uh, <laughs> but I, as far as I know, they don't get cancer. Do you think it's because they're exposed to, no? they're not exposed to like sunlight and things in the air? I have no idea. And they only eat like dirt if creatures? I remember, I thought, oh, they only they only eat dirt creatures, like worms, um, and like you know mushrooms and stuff. So, my limited recollection, I thought that one theory was that because they are naked, they have no fur or anything, that they're constantly their their bodies are constantly being like cut and chant like there are all these base like. Things that our bodies protect us from or things that like animals with shells or feathers or fur are protected from, Mm -hmm. but they're not. And I think that as a result, they might have this hypercharged immune system. That's, again, everything I said could be completely wrong, but I thought that was really interesting that there is this one mammal that does not get cancer. Um, That's fascinating. And I want some of that mole rat sauce. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Maybe that's what's in the movie bag is the secret of the mole rat. Oh, like they've taken – like they've – reverse engineered mole rat stem cells yeah. so that humans could have them. And it would, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. And it would basically mean moving forward, humans would not die of cancer. Human, like, like humans would become almost immortal. Yeah, but they can never see the light of day again. But then the idea is like there would be like, it challenges an industry. So that would challenge all healthcare. Healthcare yeah. would bait, healthcare, like, Unless it's broken bones or getting shot or getting hit by a bus, like healthcare, like hospitals, pharmacies, pharmaceuticals, everything kind of ends. The title is now The Dancer and the Mole Rat Bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to know my fun fact? Yes, please. That I learned from the internet, which is apparently in the ocean, there is, um, okay, so first of all, the ocean, there's like, 80% of the ocean that no one has ever seen, explored, yeah, if not, whatever. If perhaps even more. Who knows? Like, there's a mass amount of ocean that is unknown, mm-hmm. meaning maybe there's a megalodon. That's not my fact, though, because that's, I don't know if there's a megalodon. Apparently, there is a wall of fish that is so huge that it warps sonar on, like, the floor of one part of the ocean. It is so much an unimaginable amount of fish that just stay clumped together in this like large thing. It's this big mystery is this fish wall and nobody knows why they go there. Or How do they know it's fish? Because they looked harder. So I don't know. So they've seen it. No. They, I don't know if they've seen it properly, but they sonared it enough that they deciphered through the warping that it was fish. Okay. So I guess because it's moving. Like I guess sonar. it's moving, Like yeah. the, the, if it's a rock... It would behave a lot differently than a whole bunch of fish. Hmm. Yeah, that's, it's like, but it's this kind of, but also here's something. There is something called a mesopelagic zone of the ocean that's referred to like the twilight zone of the ocean Mm -hmm. where like weird things happen to light and it can't like, it's impossible. I think that's. My limited understanding of that, and maybe we're talking about two different things, is there are these heat vents that are so far down that, like, no life could exist except around these heat vents. And it's sort of almost – there. one theory is that this is what life was like on Earth at the beginning of the planet, like before – oxygen existed before photosynthesis existed life existed around these heat vents whoa um because i think the 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 creatures who live around they don't breathe oxygen they're they're like a different type of creature but again maybe we're talking about two i i also i could just be making stuff up i don't know i just again vaguely remember reading in scientific american a long time ago about these heat vents so the mesopelagic zone it's the twilight zone of the ocean or so they say but, you know, that's all I know is that there's a giant mystery wall of fish in the ocean. Does it have a name? I don't know. Um, I, I Probably a mystery fish wall. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so that's my one thing. I just would, I, I love, like, a couple of years ago on my birthday, in lieu of presents, all I asked people was to tell me something I didn't know. And clearly, there's a ton, meaning, I, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, but I love facts that I've, things that I've never heard before. Good to know. Like, isn't it interesting knowing that, as far as we know, naked mole rats don't get cancer? Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. I love to know that. So Now okay. I want one. I 
have a lyric of a very famous song currently. And I know that you don't always listen to pop music, do you? I don't really know anything about pop music. Right. Okay. But you are on TikTok. And so maybe you'll have heard this song before on TikTok. Because all pop songs go right to TikTok now. Oh, is it about the corn? No, it's not. It's not the corn song? It's not the corn song. Okay, that I, I know the corn. I, I mean, yeah, I'm familiar with the corn song. That's the extent <laughs> of my knowledge of pop music. Okay. Here, you have to finish the lyric. Sure, it's not the corn song. It's not I the really corn I really like song. the corn song. I know you do. Not um, so much. I mean, look, as a vegan, I take a little issue with the butter aspect of it. But there it is vegan, vegan butter. butter. Yeah, okay. Miyoko's I, is a, a, incredible. I like it better than butter, butter. Yeah, I stand corrected. I now have unconditional love for the, the corn song. I mean, can you imagine a more beautiful thing is what this kid says about yeah. corn. <laughs> it's the most precious thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Okay. Here's the lyric. I'm going to say the first part and then you finish. Okay, great. The sentence. Okay. Here we can is call this segment, old white guy finishes new pop song. Yeah, I like that. Okay, here's the first part. In a minute, I'm Anita. Increased amount of transparency from the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> is that it? We're supposed to rhyme. Well, you don't know what it's supposed to rhyme. Well, um, I like it. I like what In you said. In a minute, I'm Anita antibiotic shot after <laughs> spending too much time on the playa at Burning Man with tech bros. No, try, you get you can have some more tries. In a minute, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a private suite at Davos because they keep putting me in the same room as Robert Reich and he snores when he sleeps. <laughs> I know. Well, I don't know what any of those things you just said are. Okay. okay, try one more and then I'll tell you. In a minute, I'm going to need a way to to mine cryptocurrency that is not so environmentally destructive. <laughs> um, no, none of those are right. Do you want to know what it is? Sure, please. In a minute, I'm Anita, sentimental man or woman to pump me up. Okay, I don't understand it. You know, I'm Anita, sentimental man or woman to pump me up. Yeah, it's like make you, pump me up, make me feel better. Okay. Because things are going poorly for this person, like are not they, necessarily, but just you know, plagued by self doubt, perhaps. But okay. a little shot of confidence from someone sentimental about you is never a bad. That's thing. true. Yeah, it is. I mean, we sometimes forget that, like, just like a little word of encouragement could be the difference between someone having a great day or not a great day. Yeah, a great day or a fine day. It could be the difference between surviving and thriving. Yeah. Like if someone had just been a little nicer to Hitler when he was a painter, maybe he would not have gone on to become a genocidal dictator. Maybe if someone had just been – like if, if Donald Trump's dad had been a little nicer to Donald Trump growing up, maybe Donald Trump wouldn't be this insane psychopath, et cetera. So, yeah. So so be nice. Especially <laughs> say nice things to the people who might go on to become insane genocidal dictators. I've known a few. Yeah. You've dated a few, am I right? Huh? Am I right? <laughs> uh, I like that one. That was really fun. Okay, so what are we doing? We're making up a song. Oh, okay. Probably about the naked mole rat. Really? Yeah. I feel like people don't wax poetic about the naked mole rat quite enough. Maybe a good lyric is, can't get sick. <laughs> <laughs> How about we start, we, we can move on to, can't get sick is a good start to the chorus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, could it be like a story song? Like, um, like, like, Jack lived in a hole and he had, couldn't really see. So, so Jack is the naked mole Jack rat. Jack is the naked mole rat. Oh, as opposed to like someone meets a naked mole rat. Oh, yeah. No, Jack's a naked mole rat and he can't get sick and he's immortal and he'll never die. But it's sad because all of his human friends die. Okay, well, Jack lived in a hole with the other naked mole rats. <laughs> so far, really good. <laughs> the 
Then one day Jack left his hole and went to Baltimore where he met human people doing human people things. And he became friends with all the human people and he even started wearing a flannel shirt which he didn't need cause he was a naked mole rat. But then Jack realized cause he's a naked mole rat that he'll never get sick. That's your line. <laughs> which is great but also made him sad. Why did it make him sad? Because he realized that the humans and everything else in the world, except for maybe lobsters, can get sick. Lobsters also might be immortal. Lobsters can't die? I don't think lobsters die. They, lobsters are basically immortal as well. Like, they can die. Small rats can die too, but they, just, they don't, yeah. So if a lobster and a mole rat fell in love, they could be in love forever? And then Jack realized maybe it made sense to just spend time with other immortal beings like lobsters and other naked mole rats. And he tried to make friends with tardigrade because tardigrades are functionally immortal as well, but the tardigrades are very small and they only speak space alien languages. Okay. That was really good. I love that song. Okay, will you do me one huge favor, though? Because I love sure. this. Because you have a lot of, like, little short stories of crazy time in New York. And will you just tell one story? Okay. So towards the end of my drinking... I started doing a lot. I, I had always enjoyed drugs, but I was mainly just a straight up alcoholic, you know, and towards the end of my drinking, I was having around, I guess, like 15 to 20 drinks a night, sometimes more, and doing a lot of cocaine, a lot of Xanax, a lot of Vicodin, like whatever I could get my hands on. And one night, my friend Cynthia and I were in this bar that's no longer there called Max Fish. And it was this bar on the Lower East Side that something was always happening there. Like, you could go there on a Sunday at 3 o'clock in the morning, and it would be crowded with interesting people. And so I used to go there all the time. So it was a Sunday around 3 o'clock in the morning. It was pouring rain outside. And I went to the bathroom, and the bathrooms were disgusting. Like, when you think of a disgusting dive bar bathroom, it's the Max Fish bathroom. <laughs> like, so horrifying. Especially imagine three o'clock on a Sunday morning, like no one's cleaned this in a few days. Like it's, you know, and it's so it's disgusting. And as I was peeing, I looked down and in the corner of the bathroom floor, there was a bag of drugs. And I picked it up and I brought it back to Cynthia. And I was like, I just found this in the bathroom. And she was like, what is it? And I was like, I have no idea. <gasps> and so we invented this game called Drug Roulette. And we said, we're going to do this entire bag of drugs, but we don't know what it is. The entire bag? Yeah. Was it like a powder or pills? Yeah, it was like white or? powder. Um, okay. And so we basically did, I don't know how, what, 12 lines, 12 like big thick lines of whatever. It turns out it was like some sort of speed. <gasps> um, but I just thought like in hindsight, like what sort of out of control bottoming out addict thinks it's a good idea to do a bag of drugs you find in the corner of the bathroom of a dive bar at three o'clock on a Sunday morning with the better than likely chance. Like, what if it had been fentanyl? We would have both just dropped dead. What if it had been angel dust and you would have eaten Cynthia? Oh, well, I did have a few angel dust experiences. Angel dust was a very complicated drug. I don't recommend, I really think best best to stay away from the old. I had some... Very unpleasant, real hallucin hallucinations on angel dust. Did you eat anyone? Did not eat anyone. I did not feel compelled to eat anyone. I didn't feel compelled to throw myself off the roof of a building. But angel dust, I, I was very happy to never do it again after doing it a few times. That makes sense. It's never appealed to me. No, it's, it was, I, I didn't, the first time I did not do it intentionally. But that's a story for another time. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, the drug roulette of doing drugs that we found in the 
corner of a bathroom of a dive bar at three o'clock on the rainy Sunday morning. That was in and of itself, maybe not that dramatic, but just the idea that we were both kind of like, yeah, worst case scenario, we die. Big, who cares? It could be a fun movie called Speed 4, Dive Bar Bathroom, <laughs> <laughs> where you do speed and then um, race each other down to, the street to the on nar- foot. To the Narcan down the street. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, Moby. Yes. <laughs> um, something really cool that I would love to hear you talk more about. And in light of it being 20 years later, your relationship with David Bowie and your, like, close friendship with him. Yeah, I realized, so, like, when you were asking earlier, like, about news stuff, that made me realize it was 20 years ago this summer that I went on tour with David Bowie. And there's the weirdest, we went on, we did this tour together called Area 2. There had been Area 1, which was this super remarkable lineup. It was me and The Roots and Outkast and New Order and the band Incubus and a whole bunch of DJs like Tiesto, Carl Cox, uh, et cetera. So it was this amazing tour. And then the second year was me and David Bowie and Busta Rhymes and the Blue Man Group and again, a bunch of other DJs. The Blue Man Group? Yeah. Cool. So it was really like a bunch of space aliens going on tour. But to put it in a little bit of historical perspective, David Bowie was my favorite musician of all time. Growing up. Growing up. In the year, what would it have been, 1970-something, the first job I ever had, I was 13 years old working illegally as a caddy at a golf course. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was, I'm small now. I was very small then. And caddies are not supposed to be small. Like you're carrying golf clubs. And I still don't know anything about golf. And I worked as a caddy carrying old people's golf bags because I was too little to carry normal golf bags. And I worked this job just long enough until I made enough money to buy two David Bowie records. And one of them was Heroes. And I remember so clearly like coming home with, I I bought Lodger and Heroes and I got home and I, Lodger I liked, but Heroes was like transcendent as far as I was concerned. And David Bowie, from my perspective, was like the greatest singer, the greatest lyricist, the most inventive rock star musician of all time. You know, he helped invent New Wave. He helped invent glam rock. Like, he helped invent so much stuff. He invented ambient music with Brian Eno. And I just revered him, as did everyone, and loved him. And then in 1995, I met David Bowie. He was on tour with Nine Inch Nails, and they had a party after their show at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And someone at the party said, would you like to meet David Bowie? And I was like, how is that even within the realm of possibility? (laughs) Like, I'm a nobody, and you're asking me if I want to meet a demigod. And I met David Bowie, and what do you think? First meeting of David Bowie, what did we talk about? What was it? Guess, just guess, like, of all the things, like two musicians, two people interested in art and culture, um, two potential space aliens, what are they going to talk about when they first meet? Um, Probably, like... Um, If your answer is real estate, you are correct. (laughs) We talked about real estate. And I just was like, I was like, I'm talking to David Bowie. I'll talk about anything. And for some reason, he was really interested in real estate. And so we talked about real estate. Where? Was he like looking to buy or something? No, just generally. He was like, like, oh, and I I think I might have even blurted out like I had this tiny little cabin in upstate New York. And I was like, oh, I was just at my cabin in upstate New York. It was like this place that had no heat. Barely had running water. And so that led us to talk about real estate. And then here's where it gets interesting. Five years later, I get an email out of the blue from David Bowie. And I was like, I can't, what is this? And I I checked my manager. I was like, is this real? Is this really David Bowie? And David wrote to me and said, hey, Moby, not sure if you remember meeting me five years ago. I was like, oh, yeah, I've got it tattooed on my face. (laughs) Um, And he said, I moved in across the street from you. Now that we're neighbors, do you want to go get a cup of coffee? (gasps) And I was like, again, in what universe is this even within the realm of possibility? One, that David Bowie knows who I am. Two, (laughs) 
that David Bowie lives across the street from me. And three, he wants to meet up and get coffee. And from that, we became friends and neighbors. And so for the next like two years, we worked on music together. We had dinners together. We got lots of coffee together. We went on strolls together. And then in the summer of 2002, and at this point, David Bowie had retired from touring for health reasons. But in the summer of 2002, I said, oh, well, I'm going on tour with uh, Blue Man Group and Busta Rhymes. And David said, oh, that sounds like fun. Can I come? Stop. And I was like, okay, so once again, sorry to repeat myself, but there is no universe in which David Bowie and I meet. There is no universe in which (laughs) David Bowie and I become friends. There is no universe in which, as friends, we go on tour together. (laughs) But I've left out the single weirdest detail. What? Well, first of all, I mean, like all this, I still can't believe that this happened. My favorite (laughs) musician of all time, we became friends, neighbors, we went on tour together. He went on... He only had one condition for us going on tour together. What? That I be the headliner. So David Bowie, the greatest, most successful musician of all time, insisted that I go on last and he go on before me. Why? For the funniest reason, because he wanted to leave after his show and not sit in traffic. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so he like was you like, now. <laughs> and so he was like, if he was like, if I, he's like, he basically said, he said, if I'm, he got paid more, he was definitely the real headliner. But he said, if he said, if I go on last him, then he would be sitting in traffic because we we're playing to like 20, 30,000 people a night. And it's like 20 or 30,000 cars leaving the venue. And he was like, he just wanted to play his show and go back to the hotel and go to sleep. And so that was it. I just thought that, so not only did I go on tour with David Bowie, but technically I was the headliner. Wow. Just because he's such a pragmatic Because he was like, and and, and God bless, I completely understand. Like sitting in traffic with 30,000 cars is not fun if you just played a show. So like, yeah, so my, there, fast forward me, okay, actually rewind. It's the late seventies. I have my first job carrying old people's golf clubs just until I can make $10 so I can buy two David Bowie records. Fast forward, we're on tour together, hanging out backstage like normal neighborhood friends. It's like this crazy dream come true. It's also possible it didn't happen. <laughs> like, it's possible that none of this has happened. That like my, I do have this sort of lightly held theory that I've taken a lot of mescaline, and I'm in the desert And all of this is a hallucination, and I'm still living in an abandoned factory in a crack neighborhood. It's possible. That's my 20 years later going on tour, David Bowie reminiscence. Did you, when you were touring with him, did you ever, were you ever like hit with like, oh my God, I can't believe, like, what is that? How do you process that when that thing is happening? I mean, that only happened every single time he walked on stage. Yeah. Yeah. And at the beginning of every song he played. We also, and it's immortalized in the movie Moby Doc, um, (laughs) we played a cover of a Pixie song together on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty intense. Like, we're doing, we did a duet together. So there I'm singing with David Bowie on stage in front of millions of people on The Tonight Show. Again, this should never have happened because, like, in my world, like, I'm living in an abandoned factory with no running water. Not playing music with David Bowie on the Tonight Show. Did you? Were you nervous? Mm. I mean, do you get nervous when you are about to perform? I mean, in general. Weirdly, no. I get nervous about everything else, <laughs> but like standing on stage in front of like one time, our friend Julie uh, was in in Europe, and I was playing a show in Paris, and it was uh, I forget what's called, but it's a big festival, and there's about 150 thousand people in the audience, mm-hmm. and she and I were talking backstage. And I looked and someone said, like, oh, time to go on stage. And, like, she was like, you're going on now? I was like, yeah. She's like, aren't you nervous? And I was like, no, it's 150,000 people. Why would I be nervous? So that doesn't make me nervous. Going to a party where I have to talk to people, (laughs) that makes me uncomfortable. That's why. Because... Because you trust yourself to like, like my, my thing would always be, if I was going to do that, would be, oh, my God, what if I forget? Meh, who cares? A chord or forget a word or forget, you know what I mean? Then you forget it and you make a joke about it. Has that happened to you on stage? Oh, sure. All sorts of things have happened. For future podcasts, we can talk about like the time that I got attacked by a guy in a 10-foot-tall tree costume. 
and I had to wrestle him to the ground because he wouldn't stop attacking me. And On the pe- stage? Yeah. In, in the middle of a show, a guy, like some, some guy on drugs wearing a giant tree costume. Was he on stilts? I don't even know. But he was like, it was, it was, a, it was a 10 foot tall tree costume and he ran on stage and he tackled me. And the promoters and everybody thought this was part of the act. So no <laughs> one stopped him. And so it was a good three or four minutes of me wrestling a guy in a 10 foot tall tree costume. And he wouldn't stop fighting me. Like he was like uh, really fighting me. Wait, I love this. Maybe the next time you play live, if it ever happens, I can be the tree and we can have like a stage I don't thing. Th- no, like, but this was a re- fight back. But this was a real, like he, he was not kidding around. Like he wasn't like, huh, lighthearted tackle. Like he was fighting me. Were you scared? Yeah. I was actually like. he was like. Trying to hurt Pulling me. punches. Like not pulling, but Like wrestling, you. holding out. Like, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't lighthearted and fun. And did, were the people on stage with you that could see that there was a real uh, this was, I was, skirmish This afoot? was back in the rave days and I was touring by myself. So it was just me on stage <gasps> with like a drum machine and a keyboard and everybody was on drugs. So like no one knew what was going on. But the promoter thought that this was part of my show, that the tree guy ran on stage. And how long, did, how did it end? Three or four minutes. Eventually, like I yelled at the promoter, like, please help. And that's when he realized that the tree guy was not supposed to be on stage. Oh my so, God. Mm, that sounds really, really scary for um, a lot of reasons. I got, I'm an old guy. I got a lot of stories. Tree guy. I mean, as, as a bit, it would have been good. Oh, yeah. I mean, if it was planned. If it was planned. Or if it was involved a tree guy not trying to attack me. Like, if it was just a tree guy who wanted to wrestle a little bit, that's fine. Or smooch. But this was actual, like, scary tree guy. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry you were attacked by that tree. Meh. Better... A mildly unpleasant event that makes a good story than like a good event with no story. Maybe not a good event, but like I'd rather have like a little bit bad that creates a good story than a tiny bit banal that creates no story. Okay, good. I'll keep that in mind for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, why did I say that? (laughs) I take, I take, yeah. I'm I'm just going to like stand in your backyard in a tree costume and (laughs) jump on you when you least expect it. Triggering. Okay, I have a fan mail here. Okay. Jackson from Texas says, Loved hearing When It's Cold I'd Like to Die on Stranger Things. How did you come up with that song? Okay, well, hi, Jackson from Texas. So When It's Cold I'd Like to Die was written in 1994, almost 30 years ago. A good year. And I was making my first ever album. Like, I never thought I would have a record deal. I never thought, I certainly never thought I'd be able to make an entire album. And I wanted the album to sort of be almost a kitchen sink approach to making an album. Like, my managers wanted me to just make a dance album. They're like, people think you're a dance artist. Make a dance record. And I was like, yeah, but I want there to be punk rock songs on there. I want there to be classical pieces on there. I want ballads. And one of my favorite bands of the 80s was this obscure experimental indie band called Hugo Largo. And the singer from Hugo Largo was a woman named Mimi Gazy. And so I was like talking to my managers and I was like, do you think Mimi Gazy would be interested in collaborating? Like she's just got this amazing voice. And so she sang two of the songs on my first album called Everything Is Wrong. And one of them was When It's Cold, I'd Like to Die. And the version that was in Stranger Things, the version that's on the album, is this very minimal, you know, just strings and and female voice. Mm -hmm. And I remember playing it to my managers, and they were, like, at first really confused by it because they're like, there are no drums. And I was like, yeah, I know. And they're like, but there's no (laughs) drums. Like, this isn't a dance track. This isn't even really an electronic track. Like, what are people going to think? And I was like, I it's a beautiful song. Like, I don't really care what people think. And what was so interesting is a lot of people gravitated towards that. And then the very last song, God Moving Over the Face of the Waters, became a lot of people's favorite songs on the record. Mm -hmm. So When It's Cold, I'd Like to Die, we could never really play it live because it's so minimal, so austere. But then it was used in The Sopranos as well. I don't want to have a spoiler alert, but there's a there's a very emotional scene in the show, The Sopranos, when When It's Cold, I'd Like to Die features. Mm. And I didn't know it was going to be used in Stranger Things. 
So I was watching that last episode of the last season and all of a sudden started playing. And I was like, what is this? And when you license a song to a TV show or a movie, you never know how they're going to use it. Right. Like I licensed a song to the Val Kilmer movie, The Saint. And the song plays in a cafe while a car is driving by for approximately two seconds. Like you don't even know it, it happened. Like that, that, and that's a lot of times when you license music, that's what happens. Like, mm-hmm. it's barely in there. But then every now and then there's something like like Stranger Things where, like, they basically played the entire song mm-hmm. during one of the most emotional moments of mm-hmm. the entire series. And I felt like I was getting choked up. Other people were texting me saying they were crying while they were watching it. Um, so to Jackson's question, how it came about was the song itself is actually really simple. It's only four chords. Can you do it? I can. I have a guitar. Okay, so it's really, at its most simple, is just the opening chord, C chord, to G major, mm-hmm. F major, A minor, We could have words, but that would involve me singing it. And you don't like to sing that song. Going to do that because the original Mimi's version is so beautiful. It's so good. It's like, so haunting and um, beautiful. And when we first went on tour, we tried playing it live. <gasps> so the year was 1995, and Mimi and I were on tour. But a lot of um, a lot of our shows were raves. Mm. You know, like we opened up for the prodigy. Whoa. And we're playing raves. Or if I was playing my own show, it was people showing up because <clears throat> up until this point, they knew me as an electronic musician. So right. like people showing up wearing rave clothes, taking ecstasy, waving glow sticks around, expecting nonstop techno barrage. And there's me and Mimi on stage playing When It's Cold, I'd Like to Die. And so like the recorded version became very beloved for a lot of people but trust me live it was a disaster like Buzz imagine kill. you're playing a rave in a field in germany you go on at two o'clock in the morning in between two hardcore techno djs and you try to play when it's cold i'd like to die people are out there like no i want to i want to like, wave my light techno, stick techno, around techno. yeah yeah so it's a beautiful song that was a complete disaster played live and I'm sorry I can't sing it, but th- trust me, you don't want to hear me. No one, I mean, if you do want, you, you might want to hear me sing that song for the only reason being that it'll make you f- feel better about anything you might ever do, because nothing you do will ever be as bad as me trying to sing that song. That's not very nice. To me or you? To you. No, to, really, my version of it, like, it, it would be sad. Like, like the most embarrassing karaoke moment anyone's ever had to be me trying to sing when it's cold. Like, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So that's how it came about. And I remember Mimi Gazy coming over to my studio. And in my mind, she was like such a huge rock star because she had made an album, you know. And in her mind, she was an experimental artist from the Lower East Side. And that's how it came about. That's really cool. I like that story. Thanks. I wish I could sing it, but trust me, I, I, I mean, we my could get sem- you a kazoo. You could kazoo it. Mm, maybe that might even be worse. Than singing, <laughs> <I don't. laughs> um, that was really pretty, though. I love how you're like. It's just this chord, and then it's like strummed in a fancy way. My brain doesn't really understand. <laughs> <laughs> like if I did it, it would be like. Um, okay, great. Well, that has been the first inaugural episode of Moby Pod. And all I can say is thank you, Lindsay, for hanging out and talking about so much random stuff with me and getting me to invent a song. <laughs> I mean, there's certain things that I just, I'm sure that if I'm not embarrassed of them right now, I will be really soon. But I also think. You take the stuff you're embarrassed of and for the most part, put it out into the world and don't worry about it too much. 
Everything I do and say embarrasses me. So I feel like it's just adding to the pile of embarrassing things I've done in my life. Well, I don't, okay. But that's yeah. a that's a me problem. My therapist and I are working on it. Um, thank you everyone so much for listening to this episode of Moby Pod. We're very, very happy that it's inside of your ears and brain. And there'll be a second one coming up real soon. So soon. Just a quick little thank you to the people at Little Walnut Productions, Mike Romansky and Jonathan Nesvadpa, that help make all the things happen. BTS, that means behind the scenes in industry speak. And also thanks to the lovely folks over at Human Content. And we'll talk to you guys again in about a week. Is that correct? Probably. Okay, so should we play Southside again to go out? Yeah, give him the tunes. Okay, Drop something, the beat. Something new and modern. I mean, it's only <laughs> 24 years old. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks again. See myself in the pouring home. See the light come over, no. Oh.